and I have the advantage of going third now. And uh, again, I realize this is not the rebuttal period, but I will <laughs> probably be unable to help myself. But before I get to that, uh, I think it's useful to talk a little bit about why we have software licenses at all. What are they? You know, why, why do we need them? Um, obviously, software is a, a relatively new thing, but you know, going back in history, there's been property law for a very long time defining you know, what it means to own something and how you trade goods to other people. Um, and when software became a, a common type of work, there were issues with how those laws were, were phrased because they referred to physical objects that you couldn't make copies of without uh, an associated cost. And intellectual property is a little bit different in that people put time and effort into developing something, uh, but once it's been created, it's very easy to, to duplicate uh, and for more people to take advantage of. And so that changes the way that um, you know, you work with uh, the, the value of objects. So this, this caused there to be some, some requirement for changes in the way that people think about licensing these things. It, when I can't sell you a physical object, I have to say, I'm going to allow you to use a copy of this, but I'm going to associate certain restrictions with that. So I, I have the advantage in, in this panel of representing the license that's the oldest among these three. Uh, the BSD license goes back to uh, an academic background at uh, Berkeley University of California and uh, was, was set about the mid-80s um, as development was going on on this, this Unix-like operating system, uh, Unix derivative from a product that was developed at at and and had been shared into the, the academic community. And what ended up happening was they were sharing this code with other universities who were interested in benefiting from it and, and learning what they'd done and building more on top of it. And uh, the, the time came that the um, University of Berkeley was going to, to release this and they said, well, you know, up until now it's been covered by the AT&T source license. You know, we only gave this to people who already had a license from AT&T. Now we want to be able to give it away freely because we're not including AT&T code in it anymore. How do we do that? And so they, they went to the lawyers. Um, University of California has a, a large law school and uh, said, you know, how do we do this? And they negotiated back and forth. And it, <clears throat> it turned out that they were doing the work under a uh, DARPA contract in the U.S. And as a result, research that they were doing was supposed to be published. They were supposed to release the results of, of anything that they discovered. And so they went to the lawyers and they said, you know, we'd like to do the same thing with the source code that we do with basic research information. We'd like to publish it and make it available for anyone to build on top of and, and reuse. And so the license that they came up with was really a, a fairly close representation of that academic ideal of uh, scientific research and, and publication. And I'm going to take advantage of the fact that the other people on this panel can't do this, and I'm going to read you the license. I will, <laughs> I will shorten it a little bit, but this is the BSD license. Uh, copyright, according to a certain year, a certain owner, all rights reserved. Redistribution and use in source and binary forms, with or without modification, are permitted, providing the following conditions are met. Redistributions of source code must retain the above copyright notice, this list of conditions, and the following disclaimer. Redistributions in binary form must reproduce the above copyright notice, this list of conditions, and the following disclaimer in the documentations or other materials provided with the distribution. And neither the name of the organization the copyright owner or the names of the contributors may be used to endorse or promote products derived from the software without prior specific written permission. And the software is provided uh, by the copyright holders and contributors as is and without warranty. And there's some more legal text that expands on that, but that's essentially the whole license. And the reason that I can read that and, and the other guys can't read theirs is because if you talk about the GPL, there's the GPL version 2 and there's the GPL version 3 and they are 16 to 20 times longer. And the, the EPL is about eight times longer, so it's not quite as bad, but literally that would take their whole 10 minutes if they wanted to read you the license. Correspondingly, those documents are so much more complex that when you sit down and try to understand the implications of everything that they say, different people will come up with very different opinions. And even though the, the first version of the GPL came out in 91, if I remember correctly, um, 
there are still people today that I encounter who express a different opinion about what the requirements of complying with that license are than things that I've ever heard before. It's still open to, to interpretation because there is no you know, single statement that says this is what you must do. And, and so as a result, there are other documents that are you know, 15 more pages explaining how you might want to go about complying with the license. And then there's the new manifesto that goes into what they're trying to accomplish and so forth. <coughs> so here's the question. You know, if you take something like this to a lawyer, they will be able to understand it reasonably easily. Right? The, the requirement is straightforward, even if you're not a lawyer. Right? I've always been waiting to say this in a live panel. I am not a lawyer. Right? Um, but I can understand what the BSD license is trying to accomplish and, and what it's saying. And as a, as a company um, or as an academic, you know, if you're writing software, if you're consuming software, you are in a much better position to understand the terms that, that you're dealing with um, from that environment versus if you look at one of the, the much longer licenses that has a lot of complex terms that, that interact. And I'll take, a, I'll take a couple of specific examples. So Matt talked about the fact that uh, the GPL has done very well because it, it is a trust-oriented license. Um, it's a, he said uh, it promotes a trust-based network of giving back. Um, and I would say that's, that's actually him trying to claim that the GPL does what the BSD license does. The BSD license is very trust-based. We would like to publish the software and make it available to you. If you find a use for it, that's great. If you would like to give something back to us, that's great. Um, the GPL, on the other hand, is a, an enforcement-based license. It requires giving back. And so, uh, as an author, if you create something and, and you want to put that kind of license on it, you're absolutely entitled to. But, as a, as a recipient of that code, you have to accept the, the license that's associated with it and determine whether that's suitable for your uses or not. So. Um, the, the other question, you know, one of the things that Matt mentioned was, you know, when exactly do the, the terms of redistribution kick in? And uh, I could talk about that a couple of different ways. If you use a, a product in-house and you do your own work on it, then you're making changes to it and, and you may say, all right, this is fine, I'm, I'm using it here, I'm not redistributing it, so I don't have to share my changes. Think about the way that we do business today. People have consultants and contractors, and if someone makes changes on your behalf and they give it to you, are they redistributing it to you? That's, it's a question that I don't have a clear answer to, uh, but I think it's the sort of thing that people would end up arguing about you know, line by line through the GPL, whether you had actually committed redistribution at that point or not. Likewise, when I look at, at licenses like the Eclipse public license, um, just reading the definition of terms, I'll just pick one that was my favorite. Um, the definition of uh, contributor means any person or entity that distributes the program. Think about that. They've defined contributor as distributor. So, you know, just to understand what this license means, you need to, to think, you know, redefine English words first. Um, and additionally, the, the GPL license tends to do the same thing. Matt actually used a phrase in, in his talk. He talked about uh, the software being an entity. And really, that's what the GPL does, is it provides rights to the entity, the software itself, to be free. Uh, it's not necessarily about the freedom of the people who are using the software or writing the software. It's about the freedom of the software itself to continue to be free on an ongoing basis. And again, if that's what you want to accomplish with the license you, you apply to the code that you write, then that's all very well. Um, second last, <clears throat> Matt mentioned that uh, the GPL has been very successful, and so obviously it must be good. Um, I will reference VHS versus beta and say that <clears throat> it's not always the case that the best solution wins. And uh, finally, um, 
the BSD license has been much emulated. The Apache license, the artistic license, um, several other uh, licenses used by various different open source projects, almost all of the dynamic scripting languages are licensed under a, a BSD style license. And I think that's because they understood uh, what the original authors were trying to achieve uh, to take advantage of, of that trust, sharing, promoting um, the growth of knowledge, the availability of knowledge as a commodity, uh, and that's what they've continued to do in, in various forms since.